Hey you guys, welcome to book review 154, I believe. Uh, today I am going to be reviewing Anna Pruna, uh, A Woman's Place, the dramatic story of the first American ascent of one of the world's highest peaks by Arlene Bloom. Okay, so as the picture on the title would suggest, Anna uh, Perna is one of the tallest mountains in the world. It's over 8,000 meters, being one of the 14 8,000 meter peaks uh, that all e exist either in the Himalayas or the Hindu Kush. Um, and this was not the first ascent of Annapurna. It's not the first ascent of the highest mountain in the world. And it wasn't even the first um, woman that got to the top of Annapurna, I believe. Um, but uh, it was the first sort of large all-female uh, expedition, at least in the non-Sherpas, uh, that was able to climb one of the major 8,000 uh, meter peaks. Um, this being in the, I believe it was 1978 when the expedition uh, started. Well, in any case, uh, I should introduce you to the 10 members. Um, let's see, yeah. Uh, the leader is, of the expedition was also the author of the book. That's Arlene Bloom. Uh, there's Vera Watson, Irene Miller, uh, Piro uh, Kramer, Vera uh, K. She was, I think it's Kamara Kava, but they always called her Vera K because there was uh, Vera Watson, the other Vera. Uh, Annie Whitehouse. Let's see. Liz uh, Klobowski. Uh, Joan Fiery, Allison Chadwick, and uh, the last one was. Uh, Margie Rushmore. Now, to kind of break this down, um, you had kind of various personalities that were uh, going along this. And I'll break down the, the personalities first, and then I'll kind of talk about uh, their experience in the mountains. Um, the sort of people that were the, the uh, figure point for this were Anna Bloom and Irene Miller, uh, with Vera Watson coming on uh, fairly early. Um, additional climbers that were added were, uh, Pura Kramer and, uh, Vera K. um, those being well known. Uh, they also wanted somebody with, or some climbers that were, um, kind of not part of their crew, if you will, that were kind of, uh, superstars, uh, in the women's scene, in the women's, uh, climbing scene. Um, that also had a uh, high experience, uh, those being uh, Liz uh, Klobowski, I'm going to be murdering that, uh, and Allison Chadwick. Um, they're both being European climbers uh, that have a little more uh, high altitude experience, though really they all have high altitude experience. Uh, Allison, in particular, uh, had um, uh, Himalayan experience. A lot of the other women that had climbed uh, had climbed very difficult rock faces and uh, very difficult peaks to climb, but they were generally uh, lower peaks uh, in North America, like the Cascades and uh, even Mount McKinley, which is a higher mountain over 20,000 feet, but doesn't reach uh, into the 8,000 meter category, or I think that's like 25,000 feet, uh, that they'll eventually be pushing for in the top of Annapurna. Uh, uh, the two characters that I was kind of initially worried about were uh, Margie uh, Rushmore and uh, Allison Whitehouse, I believe is her name. Uh, yes, because they were both young. They were actually incredibly young. They were, I believe, 20 and 21 uh, when this expedition commenced. Um, some other thoughts. Uh, Piro was the team doctor. It's always good that you have a doctor on the expedition, um, even if it's as a support staff. But Piro was actually Piro was actually climbing the mountain, uh, so it helped that uh, she could be the uh, double team essentially as the doctor for sort of uh, any other in injuries. Um, I think Vera K and uh, who was the other one? Liz were probably the best ice climbers of the group. Um, 
Joan Fiery, uh, there wasn't too much uh, about Joan because she got sick kind of early on. Uh, I think if I remember right, she had, uh, yeah, she was kind of the, the, the veteran of the group, her and Vera Watson, um, and probably was a little bit past her prime to really try to uh, climb Anna, Anna Pruna. Uh, but, well, I won't tell you the spoiler, but uh, Vera is also a, somebody that was older that was on this trip as well. Um, so what did I learn in this book? Well, the primary thing is uh, there's two really major points. One, the majority of getting to the top of the peak is not the glory of the last run, but constantly the kind of the grunt work of moving supplies. Uh, this is known as the siege structure um, and tends to be more dangerous in the sense that you have to spend more time on the mountain, but tends to be less dangerous in that you have uh, uh, supply caches and areas of support uh, higher up the mountain as you kind of build up. Um, the other way is I think it's called like the freelance way or whatever. And this is essentially when you make a gun, you know, you try to gun it to the top, which leaves you less time on the mountain, but, uh, uh, leaves you more vulnerable if you are hurt because you have less support structure as you go up the mountain. Now, the irony of this being, uh, and my second point, um, is that Annapurna in particular is dangerous for avalanches. Um, in particular, the, in, uh, how unpredictable uh, the avalanches are. In a place like Everest, which has more, uh, it's obviously higher, um, the avalanches tend to be more predictable. Certainly people can die in an avalanche accident, but you can kind of uh, go the route up uh, while avoiding, mm, excuse me, the risk of avalanche. Um, and you kind of have to look out uh, for other factors. So of all things, Annapurna probably should have been a uh, sprint up to the top, but they decided to do, and what probably overall mountaineering is the safer structure uh, in laying siege. Now, before you can lay siege at base camp and work your way up to uh, you know camp one, camp two, et cetera, et cetera, you have to get from uh, Kathmandu, essentially your supply route all the way up. Now. This was an area that I thought uh, was a little weak, that the women were a little weak on. Um, it seemed like they did not have all their food and supply structure in place when they went, uh, but they would actually buy particularly food supplies um, from some of the higher mountain towns closer to, to the mountain and essentially uh, go house to house or shop to shop uh, and purchase all their um food needs, particularly in like staple foods like uh, tamsa, which is kind of like a barley flour uh, or uh, rice or various uh, uh, things, you know, staple cro staple things that you would need to carry up. Um, probably a better expedition and really probably what's become more common post 1970s is a much more kind of uh, regimented thing. Uh, this gets to me uh, me to another point that I thought was both a weak point and a strong point with the expedition. In that, uh, because it wasn't the pure kind of uh, provider-client relationship, where there was the leader that the clients paid for to get to, the, the clients paid the leader to get them up the mountain, um, all of them were kind of a collective together. Now, this probably meant that you had more even abilities among the climbers. Even the young ones were uh, very experienced, Annie and uh, Margie. Um, at least in terms of, you know, like uh, lower altitude climbing, they were very experienced. Um, but kind of tended to lead or lean to a sense of um, having to have it be a democracy uh, up on the mountain. Now, Maybe this is me just being manist or, uh, you know, the authoritarian man figure here. Um, but I think on most expeditions, you need to have an ability to audible depending on circumstances, but you also need to know who the head authority figure is because sometimes decisions need to be made like immediately, like not by the group or whatever. You just need to say, you need to do this right now in order to achieve X goal. Um, which later Arlene kind of uh, implemented her authority more, but I think, and maybe that was her plan all along, but I think uh, kind of lower on the mountain, the, she kind of had problems uh, uh, 
with people having too much uh, say. And you want to get people to say that you can, but again, you don't want to have a riot situation or like a, you know, like a defecting situation. Now talk about uh, defecting. Uh, there were two instances of defection kind of as they were moving uh, to, to the top. The first being of the porters themselves. Now the porters are the ones that would, compared to the Sherpas, the porters were the ones that would meet, move from the lower towns to base camp and essentially haul all their supplies over a longer distance, but a much lower altitude. Uh, and the, the porters also get paid quite a bit less, so maybe they have more incentive. Of course, it's less dangerous. Um, so they rebelled, I think, maybe like once or twice, and it was kind of just solved over by um, monetary amounts. And specifically, the, uh, there might be a slight ra raise in their low pay, but what really is the economic incentive for both Sherpas and I think a little bit for porters is the gear, the secondhand gear that they get. A lot of this gear is like top end, like Alpine shop, uh, you know, no, I, I'm just throwing out brand names here, but like North Face, like the really, really nice gear that a lot of times has to be given up as the, um, cr or as the team either moves up the mountain or back down the mountain and that is then given to the uh, native um, support structure in order to supplement their very low income. Um, let me see the lower route here. I guess they went over a couple rivers, including the Misery Cola. Uh, really, except for a pass at about 15,000 feet, I believe, they largely uh, kind of stayed in the valleys, as you would. Um, it provided spectacular views, but once they got beyond uh, Turkinga, I'm sure I'm butchering that to all degree, um, there were no more towns. There can be no sort of permanent settlement. So they had these very high uh, valleys that they went to that were spectacularly beautiful with the mountains all around them. Uh, but their goal was not to have this be a trek. It was to be a uh, ascent of the mountain. So they eventually get to base camp. Now let's see if I can uh, find the picture of the mountain in here. I guess I should talk a little bit about the uh, Sherpas, who would eventually, as I mentioned earlier, rebel. Um, I think I'm going to miss at least one of them. But there was Lopka, Wangle, Chuwang. Uh, Chuwang was uh, the one that had previous ex uh, experience with uh, Allison, I believe. Um, so he was kind of the high end, like the, the most experienced one. Uh, Mingma. And uh, Yishi was their high altitude cook, so he wouldn't be going up the mountain with them, but would be providing them food. Uh, Ang Pimba, where's the, uh, there's the main guy somewhere in here, I don't know what his name is. Uh, saw it earlier. Lopsang, yeah, Lopsang, he was the Siddhar. The Siddhar is essentially, a lot of times won't go all the way up the mountain, but Lopsang was kind of like the, the um, he, he was kind of the manager of uh, all the Sherpas that would go up the mountain with them. Um, so, they get to base camp. As I said, they use siege structure. Let's see if I can't get to the... Uh, yeah, here we go. That's perfect. Uh, so, really, probably the biggest hurdle in terms of risk before they started getting like up to the more steep elevations, uh, as I mentioned, was avalanches. Those were between... Camp 1 and Camp 2, and uh, basically between Camp 2 and Camp 3, about halfway, that's when they had to start going vertical up. But that first half was uh, their most uh, dangerous point in terms of avalanches because they had to go uh, under something called the Sickle Glacier. Now, a lot of times when you're in an avalanche, sometimes you can survive, but a lot of times you just get buried and it's over. So it was very much sort of a Russian roulette situation with these uh, women, women, um, going be uh, below the glacier um so uh yeah it kind of the book kind of covers the multiple times that uh they went below this glacier about a lot of the risks uh, it talks about the psychology of a number of the women as they uh kind of uh went below it um talks about who kind of uh broke track i think that's called as like the lead person and essentially is the most dangerous but is also sort of considered the most uh, prestigious or rewarding because they're the ones that are uh, the first ones up. 
Uh, early on, Joan uh, Fiery um, gets sick and it's essentially uh, acknowledged that she will not be able to make it up the mountain. Just their time frame for uh, her recovery versus uh, when they can actually make it up uh, is acknowledged as impossible. Now, one of the, I thought it was interesting, one of the strongest climbers was Liz. And Liz uh, was the one that broke the ground on the first part of the very heavy ice ascent. Remember, she's not necessarily the best high altitude climber, but is really sort of the expert in uh, breaking ground along ice faces and very difficult terrain uh, going up. Now, what is this difficult terrain going up? Well, it's known as the Dutch rib. Now, the reason that they took the Dutch rib, uh, I should actually, I can show this to you. Uh, let's see, the Dutch rib is right in there, I believe. Yeah, right there. Now, you can see there's the glacier here and there's additional glaciers here. Uh, so, going up the north face, there's actually easier climbing, but more risk of going up one of these glaciers. Uh, which is why they chose the Dutch rib, which is very demanding in terms of technical skill but is relatively low risk once you get to the Dutch rib of um, having a, a, you know, avalanche come and hit you from one of these glaciers. And it's actually interesting, the camp that they set up at Camp 3A, which was slightly, just slightly up the Dutch rib, like, I don't know, but enough to uh, avoid avalanche danger, um, and they set it up as a temporary camp until they could permanently establish Camp 3. Uh, there were a couple people that were stuck up on Camp 3A, uh, not 3, but 3A, uh, as the avalanches so essentially on both sides of this kind of precipice or rock were going down. And they weren't really, other than sort of the wind factor, which, can occasion which is dangerous and can occasionally blow you off the Dutch Rib, they weren't really in any danger of it, but they said it was sort of like, uh, they spent like three days up there. I think it was um, maybe Liz and Piro. I know Piro was one of them. Um, they uh, essentially said it was like trying to sleep in the middle of a freeway as these two glaciers would go down on either side of them. Uh, so, Liz. Liz establishes the high point uh, on Camp 3 along with, uh, I believe, um, Allison maybe, the young one. Uh, they kind of take turns, uh, as well as uh, Nigma and uh, Lop... No, not Lopsang. Uh, one of the other porters that makes it all the way up. Aang? Mi'kmaq. Yeah, Churang and Mi'kmaq, I think, were the two that uh, helped uh, break break ground, if you will, up to Camp 3. Um, but once they got up to Camp 3, Liz had to go back because, unfortunately, she uh, had real-world responsibilities, which is kind of sad and a little strange, considering she knew the, kind of the, the frame that she had to do this. But I guess she was just in a circumstance where she had to get back to Europe on a certain time period and the frame to get up to the top of the mountain was just not uh, available. But she did very important work in uh, breaking ground all the way up to the top. Um, some of the other people kind of follow uh, behind and they cut sort of amass at Camp 3. Uh, the leader, uh, Arlene Bloom, uh, decides at this point that she is not going to go up either. So they've essentially lost three of the seven. Seven are going to go up. Three are... Uh, have decided to either drop out or just hang back and not go up to the top. Um, so this is the point that uh, it really... Well, actually, I should talk about the glory first. There's all, they've also got some great pictures in this book, too. You can see, like, that's below the mountain. Uh, I should have mentioned that earlier on. You, know, you can see how tough it is. Um, also, I thought early on in the book that... I'm really rambling here, but... Ooh, yeah. Early on in the book, these girl, these women seemed a little uh, finicky, uh, but it really proves like once they get up on the Dutch rib and once they really get into their element, these are some tough women. Like they, uh, the, the vast majority of men could not even contemplate about thinking about doing this. Now there are men that could, but it just shows you, uh, as the title suggests, that uh, how tough. Uh, a, whim, a woman can be when she puts her uh, puts her mind to something. Oh yeah, see here's a good picture. That's along the Dutch rib, and if you see that little uh, circle right there with those little dots, I don't know if you can see that, that's actually the climbers along this giant giant rib uh, that's going up the course of the uh, course of the mountain. Um, so they eventually get up to Camp Three, which is 
Let's see if I can show this again. This is a good picture, which is like up in here, like above this sort of ice fall, but there really weren't any danger because once they got to the top of the ridge, uh, this was kind of more stable, so they could just move up to Camp 3 fairly easily. Uh, even though there was, uh, well, I'll hold off on that. But, um, okay, so once they get up to Camp 3, uh, Arlene decides uh, how it's going to go down. Um, they're going to be uh, hmm, four, no, five. I think it's five. No, it's four because um, Allison decides to drop out as well. Yeah, that's the case. Allison, uh, she was later than what, um, oh geez, that light's kind of strong. She was uh, later than, um, here, let me readjust this. She was later than uh, Arlene in terms of deciding to drop out. Uh, but uh, she still, uh, still decided to drop out. I think she was all the way up to Camp 3, which is above the Dutch Rib, but moving towards the top. And she just didn't really feel comfortable. So that leaves six, and she decides to break it down into a larger team and a smaller team. The larger team would be uh, Piro, uh, Margie, I believe, um, uh, Vera K, yes, Vera K, and somebody else. It wasn't uh, Watson. Uh... Oh, jeez, now I'm going to lose it. I should really acknowledge who they're going to make it. It was Margie... Al no, it was Margie... Uh, Barake... Piro... Oh, Irene. Irene Miller and... Uh, yeah, so Irene Miller, Barake, uh Piro, and uh, Margie, were the I think, were the ones that uh, decided to go up to the top. They were also accompanied by uh, a couple of uh, Sherpas, of three to be exact. Now, when they get up to the high camp of Camp 5, which is near the top, uh, but still a few thousand feet below, Piro actually uh, has frostbite on her hands and decides to stay in the tent and not go all the way up to the summit. You would think that when she was so close, she might decide to push it, but... Uh, being a doctor, she recognized the seriousness of frostbite in her hand and made the smart decision uh, to stay off. So you had the three that went up to the top with the two Sherpas. Um, Vera Kay uh, starts slowing down near the top. That's when they put the oxygen in. And something interesting about the very top of Annapurna is that it isn't a clean peak, but there's actually a bit of like scrub or rabble that's kind of on an even uh, plateau, small, but even plateau near the top. And so they actually kind of scrambled around a little bit, kind of it was funny, so long as nobody gets hurt, uh, to eventually find the true top. Uh, they took the picture, Let's see if I can find the picture. Uh, and then, uh, and then eventually, uh, yeah, and then, uh, decided to come down. Nobody gets hurt. A couple people drop out. Uh, one of the Sherpa support staff stayed near the bottom. Now, unfortunately, the tragedy was the second team. The second team had no oxygen, and they were actually not going to try for the top of uh, Annapurna 1. But a subsidiary peak that had never been climbed by man or woman uh, that was, I think, above 8,000 feet, but was not uh, separated enough to be considered a true separate mountain, but definitely achievement in terms of being the first people and particularly the first woman women, because there were two of them, that made it up to the top. Now, the two that went were uh, Vera W., Vera Watson, and Allison Chadwick. Now, I say that this is tragic because uh, even though the climbers got up near the top of the mountain and were, uh, well, they were above the Dutch Rib, uh, once they reached camp, once they reached uh, camp four, I believe, um, yeah, here we go. Once they reached camp, no, it was near camp five. Near camp five, there was uh, a slippage. And because it was kind of foggy out that morning, they couldn't exactly see what happened. And they kept calling and calling on this radio to try to, because uh, they didn't, because the base camp, um, Arlene, the rest of the crew didn't know. There were just two that were sent up there. 
Uh, and so they kept calling and calling and, you know, like the, the thing, things looked bleaker and bleaker as these women uh, didn't respond. Um, and eventually uh, Allison's coat is spotted, at which point um, some Sherpas are sent up. They act wildly because, you know, it's very, very inauspicious to see. Uh, well, I mean, it's horrible for anybody, but, you know, it's uh, just very inauspicious for these people to have deaths on the mountain. Um, and so what happened is it was these two were connected by line, um, but were not anchored uh, on a fairly flat part of the mountain. And it was speculated that somebody slipped uh, and pulled them both down. That being Vera Watson and Allison Chadwick. Allison Chadwick probably being the most well-known female climber in the world, maybe. It's certainly up there uh, at this point. Um, it was very sad. Uh, they tried to send a crew up there to pay their last regards, but another snowstorm moved in. There had been a snow, just as a little side, there had been a snowstorm uh, much earlier that it kind of had delayed things and was just another stressor that they eventually got through without any uh, casualties. But uh, fast forward to the current time. Um, yeah, so they were left up on the mountain, uh, which is kind of somewhat par for the course. You try to get them down if you can, but you don't want to have more deaths just to get somebody uh, off the mountain. Um, and they pay their respects at the bottom. Uh, you know, so it was definitely sort of a bittersweet uh, climb. Uh, the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. Here's the uh, page where they mentioned that uh, those were the two. Uh, you know, I know uh, Vera Watson looks kind of old, but she was uh, one of the more experienced non-Himalayan climbers. She had actually climbed, um, uh, starts with an A. It's in South America and is the highest point in the world outside of the Hindu Kush uh, Karakoram, uh, Himalayan mountain range, definitely the highest in the, the new world. Um, so yeah, I was in K and Vera. Uh, there was a monument at the bottom that they had their, uh, names scratched into and, uh, you know, really play, paid good respects to, uh, women that deserved highest of the high, lowest of the low. Um, and then, that was pretty much the end of the book. They uh, went back, went their separate ways. Uh, there is a little post thing about uh, what all the people did. To be honest, I didn't read quite all of it, but you can see there's the various women there. But truly an accomplishment for uh, women mountaineering and a glass ceiling broken. So anyway, Anna Peruna, A Woman's Place, the dramatic story of the first American ascent of one of the world's highest peaks by Arlene Bloom. Alright you guys, check out my reviews. Bye.